A warm welcome to Diplomatic Channel. I'm Millicent Walker. Here are the highlights of the program. As Ukraine and Russia battle for African support, Chairperson of the African Union Commission, Moussa Faki Mohamed, warns Africa not to become a geostrategic battleground for global powers. Plus, EU lawmakers ready to set a gold standard for technology agree to changes in draft artificial intelligence rules. But before that, let's check other top stories in diplomatic circles. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken met China's Foreign Minister Queen Gang in Beijing at the start of two days of talks with Chinese officials at the State Guest House, a lavish estate that typically hosts visiting dignitaries. This visit is the first by an American diplomat to China in almost five years. U.S. officials say the main goal of the talks is to stabilize a relationship that has become extremely tense. It comes nearly five months after an earlier Blinken visit was postponed following the flight of a suspected Chinese spy balloon in the U.S. airspace. South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa has told Russia's leader Vladimir Putin the war in Ukraine must end. His remarks came as he met President Putin in St. Petersburg on Saturday as part of a peace mission with leaders from six other African countries. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky welcomed the delegation but insisted that he would not enter talks with Russia while Moscow occupied Ukrainian land. Mr. Putin told the African leaders Ukraine had always refused talks. At the meeting in St. Petersburg, Mr. Ramaphosa also called on both parties to return their prisoners of war and children removed by Russia shall be returned home. Mr. Putin has been charged with war crimes by the International Criminal Court over the forced removal of hundreds of Ukrainian children from their families during Russia's occupation of Ukraine. As the African delegation called for the return of children to their families, Mr. Putin interrupted their speech and claimed Russia was protecting them. The African delegation made up of representatives from South Africa, Egypt, Senegal, Congo, Brazzaville, the Comoros, Zambia and Uganda have been specifically designed for breadth and balance, with members from different parts of Africa with different views on the conflict. EU lawmakers have agreed to changes in the artificial intelligence rules proposed by the European Commission. This is in a bid to set a global standard for a technology used in everything from automated factories to bots such as Chad GPT. The lawmakers will now have to trash out details with European Union countries before the draft rules become legislation. The biggest issue is expected to be facial recognition and biometric surveillance, where some lawmakers want a total ban and EU countries desire exception for national security, defense and military purposes. The European Union's AI Act is the first comprehensive set of regulations for the artificial intelligence industry. The law proposes requiring generative AI systems such as ChatGPT to be reviewed before commercial release. It also seeks to ban real-time facial recognition. It comes as the global regulators are racing to get a handle on technology and limit some of the risks to society, including job security and political integrity. The United States and Saudi Arabia mediators have announced a new ceasefire in Sudan. The 72-hour ceasefire commenced on Saturday. This comes as the Sudanese army and the paramilitary rapid support forces agreed to halt attacks and allow delivery of humanitarian aid. Previous truces in the country have been poorly observed. The Russian-Ukraine war has put many African countries in a difficult position. The continent is caught between Western-backed Ukraine and Russia, with whom many countries have historic ties. From the front lines, both countries have been fighting a proxy battle to win the African continent and earn support from the relative sides. Eritrea and Mali have taken sides with Russia, but half of African states have consistently voted on the side of Ukraine. Chairperson of the African Union, Moussa Faki Mohamed, says the will of each side threatens to transform Africa into a geostrategic battleground, a new version of Cold War. According to the AU chairperson, the continent has become a stage for the battle for influence among the major powers, which has redoubled since Russia's invasion of Ukraine 15 months ago. Ambassador Lawrence Obishake joins me now for more. 
Former Nigerian ambassador to the Republic of Benin and former chairman, Africa Group of the United Nations First Committee on Disarmament, International Peace and Security, Ambassador Lawrence Obishake, welcome to Diplomatic Channel. Thank you very much, Millicent, for inviting me. Many African countries have taken abstentionist positions or positions of neutrality and non-alignment in the Russia-Ukraine war. Why do you think this is so? See, nations, you know, make decisions in line with what their leaders, the, 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 the decision makers, uh, consider as crucial to their national interests. You see, the African countries, like most nations, you know, we are in a system where nation states are the prime actors on the international relations uh, scene. You know, they must have weighed in the way both pros and cons of what is going on. And, uh, you know, the people involved, there's an African proverb that when two elephants fight, it is the grass that suffers. The African countries have judged, look, this is Russia, a nuclear power country, a member of the permanent, sec the permanent member of the, of the United Nations Security Council, the inheritor of the powerful Soviet Union, USSR. And so they, they must have judged that, look, be careful. Okay? And, you know, less abstention may be better for us. Uh, not, and then judging at the, what they call the council bellies. What is the cause of this war? You see, in African power, we say, you do not blame an elder before the younger ones. See, the elder here is Russia. And uh, you know the long historical link of Russia with African countries, the War of Independence, their stance, and then they still give scholarship to many countries. And uh, it, it is it has been one of the two uh, superpowers up to 1989, 90, from 1945. So you can see that uh, it must have been, uh, from my own reading, is the the the, the interest, what the stand to lose should they vote against Russia. So abstention may be a safer and a face-saving device. But we've seen Ukraine's foreign minister, Dmitry Kuleba, you know, on a recent visit to Addis Ababa, he urged, you know, some African nations to end their neutrality over the war. And now here are some of them visiting Kiev. Do you see any change in the narrative? Well, Neutrality, from what I, uh, we have just explained now, it's a question of interests. You see, uh, people did not want to be seen as condemning a nuclear power. At the same time, they want to be seen as being fair and, jo and just. You know, normally, uh, the international community frowns at invasion of country. You know, uh, it's a sovereign state. Ukraine is a sovereign nation. And uh, although the product of the former Soviet uh, the Union, disintegration, uh, so they, they, they are also being wary. But the, the shuttle diplomacy is a very effective form of diplomacy, but to the extent that it will not make such a country visited to run, you know, on a head-on collision against a very important uh, uh, nuclear power. And, you know, uh, one of my... Uh, admired uh, professor of international relations, late professor now, Ubiozo, George Ubiozo, you know, he, he once said, he said, if you're a superpower and you want to be a member of the Security Council, one of the conditions is that you must be able to promise hell to another country and be able to deliver it on time. Nobody wants hell at his doorstep. So people are going to still remain very careful, watchful, and they, they will continue to use the multilateral diplomacy to deal with this uh, war between in, in, in Europe, on the soil of Europe. On the other hand, many are saying that it appears Russia and Ukraine are, are making efforts to woo African countries. Um, and particularly, we're seeing this trip that some African leaders are making uh, to Ukraine and also to Russia. Do you see uh, them achieving the desired results? And this is uh, Ukraine and Russia on the one hand. And then on the other hand, um, I'm sure Africa, they have a sort of peace plan that they hope that this war would come to an end. 
uh, unfortunately, this war may not end quickly uh, for many reasons, which I may explain. Uh, but now, uh, the people go and seek. You know, when, it, when we have conflicts, nations are like human beings. I have a theory I call the human beings theory of uh, nations. When husband and wives are fighting, for example, they will look for ally. They are seeking ally now. They are looking for who will justify what they've done, both of them. You know, Ukraine is defending his own territorial integrity, his sovereignty, calling on patriotism, patriots to come and fight for their fatherland, their motherland, as the case may be. But the, 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 long, the, the, the big picture that the, that the that Russians are showing us is that, look, there has been an agreement. And look, we will dismantle the iron curtain. We will free, you know, uh, Germany, Eastern Germany. But it said that there is an agreement that the NATO forces would not go and occupy the former Soviet Union territories. And now it is happening. Nobody will wait. We, we, we sympathize with Ukraine, but no country will wait and allow them to bring a nuclear powered, you know, as a NATO force forces organization to its own doorsteps. So you can also understand. And that's why the idea of Nigeria is very understandable. We are people that, uh, that we are considerate. We are, we, 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 we weigh issues. We, we, there's e e e e equity. Nigeria is known for equity, you know? You know, the time of uh, 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 the liberation of Southern Africa from apartheid, we would do, we're not there, the geographically, we were made, you know, frontline states. So, so we look at these situations. Nigeria is, an, is, is a hegemon, in, in, you know, in, uh, in West Africa. We don't just take decisions. You know, we are, we, are, we, are, we are old enough now to be able to think and to be able to take decisions in function of our national interest, in function of the interest of our region, in function of the world peace. You see, so, so they are all asking for people to join them, but all the same, people will be very wary because this war is not on our territory. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a fact. It's not on African territory, even though because of the nuclear capacity, capacity or power, you know, of one of them, uh, one has to be very careful. It can, it can, it can snowball into, you know, uh, a, a more, you know, a kind of international war, which it may become if care is not taken. So we have President Zelensky saying that Russia needs to be frozen out diplomatically. Um, I mean, are these some of the sentiments that you share? Um, we heard from uh, President Putin over the weekend say that, you know, there could be peace, but then the West should stop supplying Kiev weapons. <laughs> you see, uh, Millicent, uh, weapon supply is a very, is about the most lucrative industry in the world, you know, the armament industry. Well, I was in uh, the first committee of the United Nations. We used to say one thing that, look, Small arms are like weapons. They are our own weapons of mass destruction. It's killing us, but people are making money out of it. That is, it, it's immoral, you think. But uh, the truth is that uh, uh, people who want to defend their national interest, some people are making money. It's not free. All these weapons that are being given to Ukraine, it, it's not free. They are going to make money. Some people are waiting for the war to end one day, and they will know that there will be a reconstruction in Ukraine. And they have, they have the way with that. European so countries, who, other, who would you say is benefiting the most with all the weapons supply to Ukraine? Who is what? Benefiting the most. Oh, in the supply? Oh, well, <laughs> it's, it, uh, it's difficult to say, but uh, there are suppliers. People that are supplied, uh, they, they, you, you know, recently it was found out that even Russian weapons are found in the hands of, uh, remember they were of the same Warsaw Pact. They were members of the United, you know, the USSR, United so so Soviet Socialist uh, Republic, you know. So it it's it, it like the porous and interethnic. It's like an interethnic war, you know. They both speak some dialect of Russian, you know. Russia used to be their their official language, you know, in Ukraine, and they produce practically the same thing, you know. Many African countries depend on the grain from Ukraine, and also technology from Ukraine. 
just like they depend from those uh, elements also uh, from uh, Russia. So that this is what it is. Who is benefiting? They know we, we don't produce such arms in Nigeria. We could have been one of those who are supplying them too. So those who are supplying know themselves and they know why they are doing so. That is the hypocrisy in international relations. And that's why our country should not be strong. You cannot rely on many people. It's one of the theories of international relations anyway, that it's a wild war there. And no, nobody, no policeman. In, in international relations, you can't call on 911. Nobody will answer you. See? That's why we look for allies. And that's why we must be strong. Our first defense, which is our foreign policy objective, is our national interest. And our national interest can only be, be defended effectively when we are strong. We are strong army. We are strong people, first and foremost, who are patriotic, ready to defend their country. That's very important. But when you are having inter-ethnic warfare, you make yourself uh, vulnerable because the in, in intelligence this world, they will make a mess of you. This is what uh, I have to say about that. I hope you get me right. You listen. Indeed, Ambassador Lawrence Abishake, thank you for joining us on Diplomatic Channel. You're welcome, it's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. The United States of America says it remains committed to promoting democracy and all its tenets in Africa. This is according to the National Security Council Senior Director for African Affairs, Jude Devermont, who spoke at a press briefing on the progress made over the last six months in implementing the achievement of the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit 2022. At the summit, uh, it may have escaped uh, people's attentions, but President Biden had a side meeting with six of the leaders who were facing elections in 2023, with Gabon, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Liberia, uh, DRC, and Madagascar. And in that meeting, President Biden talked about both the U.S. challenges when it comes to democracy and elections and how we are striving to do better, but also solicited uh, the views of his African counterparts ahead of their elections. We made a substantial commitment, $165 million uh, to invest uh, in these elections in 2023. And at the conclusion of these elections, as uh, we just did in Nigeria, the president sent a high level delegation, in fact, the biggest delegation that he has sent in his administration to an election uh, to welcome President Tinubu and to engage uh, with the Nigerian people as they work to strengthen their democracy. So throughout this year, we remain focused on not just elections, but all the parts of the process that strengthen democracies and show uh, that this system delivers uh, for people. A group of U.S. lawmakers says the U.S.-Africa trade summit scheduled later this year in Johannesburg should be moved, citing South Africa's deepening military relationship with Russia. A letter from the U.S. lawmakers indicated that they were seriously concerned that hosting the summit in South Africa would serve as an implicit endorsement of South Africa's damaging support for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The letter by the four members of the United States Congress to Secretary of State Antony Blinken requesting the removal of the Agoya meeting billed for November has sparked a national debate over South Africa's stance on Russia's war with Ukraine. Political analyst Sanet Solomon says the United States is not necessarily declaring an economic war because of South Africa's position. As you mentioned, quite intricate. don't think that they're necessarily declaring war on uh, South Africa, but I also think that South Africa, while it's said that it is taking a middle stance in terms of this, has shown to be more partial towards Russia. And while it has not proven to be an actual threat to the U.S., the um, allegations in terms of South Africa possibly giving weapons to Russia could mean that uh, South Africa could be a possible adversary to the U.S. And I think that is one of the things that they are most cautious about. But I also think that just in terms of this AGOA, South Africa would be negatively impacted if the U.S. had to proceed in terms of um, removing the country from that list. Could South Africa lose its Agoya status? And what will this mean for the economy? The problem South Africa finds itself as it is now, and we've got to tread very carefully. We cannot afford to just shout and, and say they can go to hell. Because when we say that, 
it is not really going to do us any good. However, by the same token, the USA, when it, when it is threatening to remove us from ACOA, they will not do it. I'll tell you why. The USA needs South Africa in the same way as South Africa needs the, U, the US. They're not doing us a favor by, by, by buying many things from, 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 from us. Trade between South Africa and the US stands at around 10 billion US dollars with thousands of South African goods entering the US under the preferential trade regime. The country is one of the major exporters of citrus fruits to America, importing just under 9 million boxes of fresh citrus fruits in 2022. That number jumped 300% to over 37 million boxes. The question remains, is Agoya still a big deal in South Africa or the country is better off trading with the BRICS nations? China accounts for 22% of, 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 of our total trade. However, note this, China has got the largest reserve dollar and and China does a lot of business with the USA. So will it make sense for us to, to cut down our trade? President Cyril Ramaphosa will lead an African peace mission to Russia and Ukraine in the upcoming days. Analyst says it's not enough. I don't think that um, the South African presidency is doing enough. I think that this is a very complicated situation and I don't think that we understand the nuances of this. If you look at this whole thing, it would have a ripple effect and impact on numerous South Africans' lives. As South Africa strives to overcome the challenges of the electricity crisis and inflation, the uncertainty around its Agoya status adds another layer of concern to its economic outlook. The international environment has become more complex given the ongoing war in Ukraine, the adverse effect of climate change, human trafficking, among other issues facing countries of the world. And there is a need for qualitative representation of diplomats across the world with these global concerns in mind. For this reason, Nigeria's Ministry of Foreign Affairs recently churned out new diplomats in Abuja, the nation's capital. The Permanent Secretary, Ambassador Ahmed Lamoua, charged the new diplomats to ensure quality representation, work with integrity, dedication and empathy to ensure the implementation of the nation's foreign policy to make the lives of Nigerians in the diaspora better and easier. Responsibility being placed on you now. You have to be very, very upright, honest, hardworking, diligent, and emotionally stable, as coined by our dear sister, Ambassador Chitro. Uh, today's diplomacy deals with the complex of uh, interrelated set of global issues to which you as younger officers, you'll be going out there, you really feel workers, you will attend conferences, you attend seminars, you come back and sit on your desk, write reports and advise headquarters. By advising headquarters, you are taking the responsibility of advising the machinery of governance, your opinions, your own little remarks, comments, observations is what we develop in form policies that will give government the direction. As relations between Australia and Russia become embittered in the wake of the invasion of Ukraine, the former has moved to rescind permission for the building of a new Russian embassy near its parliament in Canberra, citing spine risk concerns. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said intelligence agencies had given very clear security advice on the move. Laws specifically drafted to halt construction were rapidly passed on in June after legal attempts to stop the Canberra development failed. The Kremlin says it's yet another unfriendly action which Russia would take into account in the future. But for Russia's spokesman Dmitry Peskov, Australia is following the Russophobic hysteria that is now going on in the countries of the collective West. The new legislation acknowledges that Russia may be eligible for financial compensation. 
The present embassy will not be affected by the new laws, which have bipartisan support. Moscow currently holds the lease for a patch of land acquired in 2008, some 400 metres from Canberra's Parliament House. It has been laying the foundations for a new embassy building, but construction had progressed slowly. The government has received very clear security advice as to the risk presented by a new Russian presence so close to Parliament House. We are acting quickly to ensure the lease site does not become a formal diplomatic presence. The government condemns Russians, Russia's illegal and immoral invasion of Ukraine. And that's Diplomatic Channel this week. You can watch this and other episodes again on our YouTube channel, forward slash channels web, and our channel's playlist. I'm Millicent Walker. I'll see you next time.